The extreme Puritans, therefore, begin to feel for the Old Testament a preference, which perhaps they did not distinctly avow even to themselves, but which showed itself in all their sentiments and habits. They sought for principles of Jewish prudence in the Mosaic law, and for precedents to guide their ordinary conduct in the books of judges and kings. Their thoughts and discourse ran much on acts which were assuredly not recorded as examples for our imitation. Morals and manners were subjected to a code resembling that of the synagogue, when the synagogue was in its worst state. The dress, the deportment, the language, the studies, the amusements of the rigid sect were regulated on principles not unlike those of the Pharisees who, proud of their washed hands and their broad phylacteries, taunted the Redeemer as a Sabbath breaker and a wine bibber. It was a sin to hang the garlands on a maypole, to drink to a friend's health, to fly a hawk, to hunt a stag, to play at chess, to wear love locks, to put starch into a ruff, to touch the virginals, to read the fairy queen. Rules such as these, rules which would have appeared insupportable to the free and joyous spirit of Luther, and contemptible to the serene and philosophical intellect of Swingle, threw over all life a more than monastic gloom. The learning and eloquence by which the great reformers had been eminently distinguished, and to which they had been in no small measure indebted for their success, were regarded by the new school of Protestants with suspicion, if not aversion. Some Precisians had scruples about teaching the Latin grammar, because the names Mars, Bacchus, and Apollo occurred in it. The fine arts were all but prescribed. The solemn peal of the organ was superstitious. The light music of Ben Jonson's mask was dissolute. Half the fine paintings in England were idolatrous, and the other half indecent. The extreme Puritan was at once known from other men by his gait, his garb, his lank hair, the sour solemnity of his face, the upturned white of his eyes, the nasal twang with which he spoke, and above all, by his peculiar dialect. He employed on every occasion the imagery and style of scripture, Hebrewisms violently introduced into the English language, and metaphors borrowed from the boldest lyric poem of a remote age and country, and applied to the common concerns of English life, were not the most striking peculiarities of this cant, which moved not without cause the derision both of prelatists and libertines.